The French fry shop is here. In the land of the Chittis, Vienni came up with an original idea for his three children's birthday party. To bring in a French fry stand in front of his house on the sidewalk. I mean it. This 34-year-old bus driver is also organizing a party for his neighbors who are moving to Brittany. Makes you hungry. So, ladies and gentlemen, for a little farewell drink, it's not bad. For a first, oh yes, definitely. Have the little ones already chosen what to take? For Kelly Vianney's wife, calling on this Hauts de France institution was an obvious choice. It's the north of France, so we're all about French fries, fries and frikandel. So, and it's convivial and about washing up and all that. I don't take care of anything, just the aperitif, that's all. Kelly had initially contacted a caterer, but the 700 euro bill was too high for her budget. The caterer charged her 450 euros for his service. For 25 guests, or 18 euros per person. More expensive than a fast food, but guests can help themselves to as much as they like. At will. Uh, can I have some nuggets? Julian, the manager of this in-home French fry shop, is also happy about it. It pays for itself and makes a small profit. On something like this, 200 euros, 200, 200 of a euro. That's still okay for a morning. These are real fries, they're not greasy, they're crispy. Exceptional, just look at that. Oh, they're good. Oh yeah. We feel like we're on vacation. See you soon, goodbye, thank you, goodbye. In a region where French fries are everything, Julian has his work cut out for him. Whether it's a baptism, a wedding, or a company seminar, his truck is booked up for the next two months. Goodbye. A symbol of northern France, French fry shops are more popular than ever. Their number has increased by 25% in five years. There are now almost 1,400 of them all over France. I'll take you a small chip. Golden? Oh, yes. It's the best. Business is under severe pressure this year. Oil, an essential ingredient, saw its price double in the spring. Not to mention the staff shortage. We went to meet the king and queen of French fries. How do they manage to adapt and retain their title? A light meal. Hello, sir. David Fontaine, 45 years old, is an Elvis Presley fan. Rock and roll. I'm a rock fan. That's what I am. I had a bit of a banana before, but then you have to go with the times. You get a little older, you lose your hair, but you try. There you go. A rocker who makes French fries. In 2021, his place was voted France's best French fry shop by internet users from a field of 2,500 professional candidates. Come on, let's get to work. Are those frozen fries? Oh, no, not at all. It's fresh French fries. Chip. Peeled, washed, cut. When you're making five, six tons of French fries a month, you can't afford to peel potatoes, or you'd need someone to stay overnight. Every morning, the king of fries prepares them to the highest standards. In two batches. There aren't 36 ways to make French fries the way our grandmothers did. In fact, we use beef fat. It gives them a nutty taste. So now I'm pre-cooking them at 130 degrees. It'll take between five and seven minutes. That means we're going to cook the heart of the potato, in fact, as if it were a boiled potato. On top, we let it cool. And at the customer's request, we'll throw it into a second bath at 190 degrees to give it the final Christmas in color. Before opening to customers' reception of goods. David has been hard hit by the surge in raw material prices since the beginning of the year. Oil, but not only. Beef fat is here. 
10 kilo boxes. This has become gold. It went up 37% in May. And we can't change a thing. We're obliged to continue with one way of working. Go ahead, my little wee wee. Do you know how much the sauces went up, wee wee? About 12%, I think. 12 to 15%, the sauces. In fact, everything has gone up. Because you need to know that oil is everywhere, in fact. In sauces, you can see it there. Chopped steaks have gone up quite a bit, too. 15%, I think. Why is that? Because now it seems they can't get their steaks from the European Union. And they only source from France. So there you go, another excuse, or we don't know. Either way, we'll never know. The problem with an increase is that it goes up, but it never comes down. David hasn't yet passed on all his increases to his card. But it won't be long. For the moment, he's cutting his margins by 20% and uses a few tricks to get by. We put in a little less fries, a little less sauce, a little less crab. Rather fewer crabs, but even that's not enough. This year, on top of that, potatoes are going to go up because there's not enough water. So this year, we're going to have small potatoes that are going to be very, very expensive, too. His French fry shop is open seven days a week. David is helped by two employees in a cramped 12 square meter space. A bartender from the age of 16, he dreamed of becoming the champion of French fries. So much for my little madam. Two weeks training with a frying buddy before 11 years ago he bought this idle shack. Come on, five euros, 10 for monsieur, please. Welcome to potato heaven. Enjoy and have a nice day. David is located on a strategic route to Lille. This is the third time he's been number one in the famous ranking. We said to ourselves, the best chip stand in France next door to us is a must. There are fries and fries, aren't there? These are delicious, crispy, melting. Delicious. We're going to finish everything, aren't we? Not at all, then. His loyal clientele includes high school students, employees who work in the neighborhood. They're here every day. In fact, we'd like a loyalty card, wouldn't you? It's the right atmosphere, and it's better than the fast food chains next door. Why is that? For one thing, it's cheaper. The fries are better cooked and bigger. David sells his small fries for two euros 90. The board is generous. In a traditional fast food restaurant, to get the same quantity, you'd have to spend four times as much. Burgers and aperitifs. Don't work too hard, guys. Just pretend like we do. Oh, hi, bon appétit. His French fry shop is his whole life. Even when he goes home after lunch shift. Isn't it the last straw to live next door to a French fry shop? We can monitor everything. I can see my customers a little bit if they go here or there. During his afternoon break, no resting, handling paperwork and orders. Barely enough time for a home-cooked burger. Long days of fries. That broke up his relationship. I separated two years ago from the woman. The woman I lived with, 16 years. Living with a shadow, it's a bit like that. I'm never there, so I'm not there at the dinner table. In the morning, she wakes up, I wake up after her, she goes to work, that's it. You didn't think at the time, I'm quitting the French fry shop to save my relationship? And do what? And to do what? What would I have done? The restaurant business has always been my life. Today, David's only wish is to slow down the pace of his work. But like many restaurateurs, he's having trouble recruiting. After testing 20 candidates over two years, he hopes he's finally found the right one. Hello, young man. How are you? How are you? Just fine. You're the one? Florian, 28 years old, seems very motivated. All right, listen, nice CV. What motivates you in the restaurant business? Human contact, from first and foremost. Okay. We'll do whatever it takes to turn you into a French fry machine. To seduce Florian, David has some strong arguments. He pays his employees 200 euros more than the minimum wage. He's going to test the young man right away. Florian only has a year's experience in the restaurant business. 
in the French fry shop. He seems a little lost at first, then too relaxed. Come on, big guy. You've got to be frank here. In the kingdom of fast food, Florian moves like a snail. A little bit, look. Look at your tray. Your pestle's not in the grease, so it's never going to cook. You take your tongs and you put it correctly in the fat. Thank you for that. So good. The Provencal sandwich skewer will get the better of him. I can't do it. Lucky for Florian, David didn't see a thing. But after his trial day, the young man didn't come back. David had no intention of hiring him anyway. He found him too soft. Last year, due to a lack of staff, he had to close every weekend in high season for two months. 18 euros round. Well, there you have it. All you have to do now is enjoy it. If it's not good, we're closed on Mondays. See you soon. 50 kilometers away, still the flat country. Slag heaps. And two sisters struggling to dethrone King David. Nelly and Peggy are second on the podium of the best French fry shops. One of their lethal weapons is their homemade sauce for topping their fries. Peggy, the eldest, 48, is in charge of the cheese and fresh cream sauce. Nelly, 45, the cheddar cheese sauce. Made with lager, mustard, and grated cheddar. We like to do what others don't do. It takes time, but it's homemade. Before we succeeded, we made it four or five times, and I either burned the cheese or it made blocks because I missed it and it stuck. Their cheddar sauce is also offered to customers in their Welch, the famous northern grilled cheese. Also homemade. You're not supposed to dip your toast in the sauce, but we do so it tastes better and the toast is less dry. And an egg is added at the end. A fried egg, of course. She's too good. Cooking for the French fry shop, we're good. Cooking for us, Peggy is the best. Nelly and Peggy have been cooking since they were little. First in the restaurant business, then in a food processing plant. They dreamed of working as a family, like their parents who ran a cafe. 13 years ago, they refurbished an old caravan to turn it into a French fry stand. The weather's fine today. It's a beautiful day. I hope we'll be busy at lunchtime. Today, their French fry shop is set up in the village square. Nelly and Peggy pay the town council 1,500 euros a year for their location. And the two sisters have invested in a veranda. Here we go. Always with the idea of standing out and protect customers from the northern climate. So in winter, they're going to put in two or three tables. The same goes for the workers who come and set up shop. So yeah, it attracts people. Yeah, no, everyone knows the idea we had. Did you invest? Yeah, we invested, yeah, yeah, because glass is expensive. How much did it cost you? Too much, over 30,000 euros. The French fry runners up employ five people, including two delivery drivers. Hello. A state of the art French fry shop. With home delivery from the COVID, Nelly plays telephone operator like in fast food restaurants. Oh, right, right. In a loaf of bread and all the vegetables. Okay, modified. Thanks. See you later. Peggy is in charge of the fries. Unlike David, she cooks them in sunflower oil, another school. A lot of people say that beef fat has a very strong smell already. The French fries regrow quickly and stick to them. They have trouble digesting it compared to sunflower oil. Nelly and Peggy have had to increase some of their prices. A punnet of fries, for example, has gone up 50 cents since May. With French fries, right? What sauce is in it? 
This doesn't stop regulars from coming. Some, like Jan, a tattoo artist in Bethune, even drive 20 minutes a day. We chat with everyone, in fact. Everyone knows everyone else. Hello, hello, what's his name? We settle in. It's a bonding experience. That's what's in our hearts in the north of France. That's just the way it is. The two sisters have even branched out into tacos, the new sandwich craze, to keep up with the competition. Well, bon appétit. Thank you. Because this Pas de Calais village has three French fry shops for just 6,000 inhabitants. Peggy doesn't always look too kindly on this. There's one here. It was the first French fry shop in the village. They need a fix, they come, they know it. It's the same for us, so there you go. With the second one, relations are a little more strained. He'll be over there on the right. So I'm going to turn left. This is it. Can we stop here? He's one of our competitors who set up shop not so long ago. How does it work? Ah, he likes to copy us. He didn't do tacos, now he does. He tried cheddar sauce, but he used cheddar. But we don't, it's a homemade sauce, so... It's not the same thing at all. What if we had a fourth coming in tomorrow? Good luck with that. Because that's what it takes. Bickering? Anecdotal compared to the soaring price of oil. Yeah, as usual. The conflict in Ukraine, the main producer of sunflower oil, has brought exports to a screeching halt. We're currently using this one, sunflower oil, for 25 liters. Before it was 33 euros before tax, now it's 106 euros before tax. Since the war in Ukraine, it's skyrocketed. Yeah, it's shameful even. It's worse than triple. It's not feasible. It's too expensive. We're going to charge five euros for a fry. We're allowed two cans a day, but only when we can find some. So we keep a stock of sunflower oil. We're finishing the stock and then we'll see how things go. No oil, no fries. The two sisters only have enough to last a month. So they took the initiative. They decided to test a new vegetable oil. 80 centimes cheaper per liter and above all available. In these cans, a blend of rapeseed, sunflower and palm oil. A highly controversial product. Apparently they're still nice fries. Yeah, they are. They look good. The aesthetics are there. What about the taste? For this, they called in an expert, Olivier Pouch, who came with his second in command. He's a friend, a master restaurateur, a label that guarantees 100 homemade. Uh, very, very good. Just right. There's nothing to say, frankly. It's already golden, golden and crispy. A little more potato flavor. Good, yeah, huh? yeah. The oil mixture gives a different taste. The fries are smoother. I validate, awarded. Nelly and Peggy are reassured. They'll be able to continue making fries with less expensive oil and grow their business. Because these little potato matchsticks make a profit. Far from the shacks of the north, some smart guys are making money without being soaked in frying oil. Tom Gessman, cans deep fried in the sun on the French Riviera. It's true that the work environment is perfect. And on top of that, we make French fries and send them up north, so it's a perfect working environment. Tom is one of the four main suppliers of French fries. Managing a snack bar in Fraser's for seven years, he was saturated with long hours. Three years ago, he came up with the right plan. Set up a factory to produce the famous fresh French fries. This truck has just covered 1,300 kilometers. It's good. It's delivering 15 tons of potatoes to Tom from Dunkirk in the north, France's leading potato producing region. It's Manitou, one of the best varieties, along with the binge for French fries. We're careful not to drop them, because sometimes that happens, unfortunately. 
careful there. Voilà. Live. It's gonna make good fries anyway, fortunately. French fries? Tom has been immersed in it ever since he was a child. With a French mother, and above all, a Belgian father. His parents couldn't understand why he had to do all the peeling in his restaurant. Tom, why do you make your own fries? In Belgium, we only eat vacuum-packed fries, whether in supermarkets or elsewhere. So I did the first tests at my restaurant. And the idea was incredible. Three, four years ago, we were revolutionaries. And now everyone wants one. Tom invested 150,000 euros in this factory. It supplies 80 French fry shops in both the north and south of France. Only two workers, one at each end of the line. Everything else is automated. So this is something abrasive, which will sand the potato and remove the skin. This saves us an incredible amount of time. We peel about 30 kilos every minute. And then, diving in the pool for a first wash before moving up a level for cutting. These are razor blades, so we have to be very careful because we're used to cutting ourselves. So the knife is placed directly under the cutter and is driven by the motor you see here, which will really cut the fries so as to get a very clean cut. The classic caliber, according to custom, one centimeter thick. French fry shops, on the other hand, prefer to order from Tom at one centimeter 20. Their customers prefer bigger ones. Here, for example, since the potato isn't square, we're bound to have a lot of deep fries, which we won't put in the potato bags. But nothing is lost. The waste is recycled into natural gas, which is sold to EDF. A final bath, always without chemicals, before being drained, then weighed. The fries are vacuum packed, and that's it. It has become a business that has tripled in three years. It's a great source of income. Tom, for his part, earns 2,600 euros net from his production of fresh French fries. But nowadays, it's possible to make fries that are just as good as the ones you get in chip shops. In Lens in the north, Doris is an institution. Take some back after boiling. 26 years of friterie. For the past two years, she and her son Frederick have been offering fries making classes. The basic rule, even at home, is to cook in two batches and be careful not to mess up the after cooking. I thought that when you put the fries in, as I'm afraid you do, the oil has to sludge. No. Not at all. If your oil is too hot, when you put it in the pre-cooker, it'll seize up and harden very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So you think it's not cooking, but... The post-cooking at 150 degrees takes 10 to 15 minutes. See, how, when you open it, there's flesh inside. Like this. Soft, soft. Makes you hungry. It's all about the right temperatures. You pre-cooked all your fries, you let them rest, and then set your speed back to 190, and just like that, you'll have a crispy chip. So if I do this, then I do this. Another tip is to make sure the oil is clean. I use a little strainer to remove it, because otherwise, when you make your fries, at some point, you get little gray ends on them. That's what you remove. If you leave it in oil, that's what makes it burn. But people don't usually do that. Well, at home, no one does. Little secret. Noise. Doris listens to her fries. Can you hear the noise? Here, yeah, I'll sing. That dry sound. Is the guarantee of a not too fatty fry. Well, we can eat them. Participants paid eight euros for this one and a half hour workshop, including tasting. I think they'll be easy to digest. There, there's air in them, you see. It's not, it's not poof. And we eat something, don't we? 
I'm going to buy five kilos of potatoes, eh, for practice. So, ladies and gentlemen, what's the verdict on the fries? Well done. With 55 kilos of potatoes eaten per person per year, the French remain among the world's biggest consumers of the crispy little stick. Have you been to the inn before? No. Is this your first time? Yes. You'll find that everything you ate there this lunchtime was prepared with local produce. This couple drove 40 kilometers from Lille to enjoy a mysterious gastronomic experience. The first course is a brioche with Eliantis. Eliantis is a cousin of Jerusalem artichoke. Thank you for that. Come on, let's try it. Everything served here is produced, grown, or fished in the north. You continue with whiting stuffed with cabbage, with a cabbage lacto-fermentation juice. You've got kale on top, and hidden underneath is cedra. It's a variety of lemon that we've had here in Flanders for a while, so it's a pleasure to serve. OK, perfect. Thank you very much. Kathy and Charles are about to taste 10 dishes. Hay smoked pork belly with endive salad. Shawarma celery, cooked on a spit like a kebab. Or for dessert, pear sorbet with sunflower praline. A culinary voyage to Flemish lands at 76 euros per person. It almost looks like radish at one point. I've discovered a lot of fruits and vegetables I didn't know before. Flavors brought up to date, intriguing and appealing. The establishment is fully booked for lunch and dinner. You have to book two months in advance. Behind the stoves, Florent Laden. The atypical creator of all these dishes. Grilled herb bouquet, smoked butter sabayon. We point out that there's a string. A hipster look with no chef's hat or white jacket. It's me, it's my style, but it doesn't stop me. You can be a chef and have a beard. We're in 2000 what? In 2022? All right then. Tattoos, fork, knife, because I love the table. Hewitt, because all my restaurants are eight letters. Because I was an aide in rugby, there are others, but we're on duty here, so I can't show them off. At the age of 37, the chef is like his cuisine, 100% regional. Born in Hasbrook in the north of France, Florent has been a Flemish descendant for several generations. I put my meat in an oven to dry at 150 degrees to make it crispy. Faced with the 15 other hopefuls competing in this competition, he defends a simple cuisine. I'm not here to distort the products, I'm here to try and bring out the best in them. Nice visual there. What interests me is the texture of the chips. It's beautiful, it's clever, and it's good. This enthusiast now seeks to sublimate the products of his terroir. Saddlery, cabbage, endives salsified, and even potatoes. Six rutabagas, please. At the head of four establishments, all in the Nord region, of course, he employs 64 people and generates sales of 4 million euros. How are you, young man? I'm very well. How are you? A chef determined to rekindle the flame of northern gastronomy. This is good. No, but it's very good. Not exactly renowned for its exceptional terroir. Lost in a village of 2,000 inhabitants in the hills of Flanders, Nothing predisposed his inn to attract attention. Except since Florent set himself the goal of cooking only with ingredients he could find within a hundred kilometer radius. Today he's testing a new recipe. Quail, raised in Pas de Calais, marinated in Mirabelle plum juice. Pick 10 minutes from the inn. The juice isn't sieved all the way through, but if you're only going to use the pulp for the Mirabelle plums, that's something you'd have to keep. The stones and skins too. The traditional recipe is for grapes. But for Florent, that would be heresy. If I want, I can work with fresh grapes. 
I can find them. The stuff will cross the planet to end up on my plate. But we're only going to work with local produce, and we don't want to have that burden on our conscience. The fact of thinking, come on, in my plate, here, all accumulated, there are 20,000 kilometers. For 20 seconds of pleasure, it's a bit stupid. If you got the products, you can throw them at me. I'll give it a try here. So the quail has marinated for a good 20 minutes. I'm just going to drain it a little. Even the cooking is local color over an open fire. Oh, that's beautiful. With beech wood from the surrounding forests. So my little quail, let's taste the quail. It's now, kids. Yes. Leeks, onions, and Mirabelle plum condiment. Impressive. The little julienne of pear with onions, that brings it all together. Frankly, it's really good when you take the whole thing. Just the quail, I'd say, maybe. I'm thinking more of grilling the skin. The test is conclusive. Quail will soon be on the menu. OK, kids. Do I have a table for two on the whiting? Here. No olive oil, no vanilla, no chocolate. Too exotic. Even the salt no longer comes from Guérande in Brittany, but from a producer in Pas de Calais. For every banned ingredient, Florent had to find substitutes. That. We don't have lemon juice, for example. We're going to use fermented salsify juice. It's very, very lemony. Or sour flower vinegar. For the pear, we use juniper berry. We don't use almonds. We use meadow sweet instead. We once managed to make a chocolate by drying mushrooms, caramelizing them, and adding fermented mushrooms. To finish the meal, no coffee either, but a blend of chicory and roasted sunflower. With his radical choices, Florent has shaken up the family inn. Years later, his grandparents bought the farm. It was taken over by his parents, who transformed it into an estaminet. Not very particular about the origin of the products. Flemish gambas or carbonates, but with beef from Poland. Florent learns the trade from his father. After attending hotel school in Dunkirk, there was no question of working anywhere but in the Nord region. Finally, in 2012, his father, Jose, handed over his apron. To this day, he supports him at the inn. We're going to do it right before the pouring. When Florent decided to follow in my footsteps, I said to myself, listen, you didn't choose the easiest profession. And as he was determined, I told him to rest on it. We'll talk about it tomorrow. And then, and then the next day, I tried to duck the conversation. But he came back to the attack, and he told me, that's it. My decision is made. So here, Dad, I'm going to be part of the team. Florent transforms the country inn into a gourmet restaurant. His inventive recipes earned him a Michelin star in 2014. And what do you think of his cuisine, Jose? Hey, it's all good. Sometimes I have to have certain explanations about certain dishes, but as I have a good appetite and I know anyway that it's made with a lot of passion and love, it's really all good. It's a real delight. It's not classic, is it? It's not a classic, but it's a good one anyway. But in 2020, the enfant terrible of the ovens loses his star. As usual, the famous culinary guide gives no explanation. I was surprised when they took away our star, just as I was surprised when they gave us a star. Because in my eyes, we're pretty unclassifiable. But I'd never looked in the mirror and said to myself every morning, Flo, you're a starred chef. That's great. You've made it. What I want is to have my restaurants fully booked. So I can pay everyone at the end of the month. I was afraid that losing my star would mean a big drop in business. But the opposite happened. He lost his award, but it didn't change the concept. Quite the opposite, in fact. Since he doesn't import or freeze anything, 
Florent has to make do with what he finds in the country, depending on the season. And he changes his menu every three weeks. This morning, he has an appointment with Driss, his main market gardener, who supplies him with 60% of his vegetables. It's impressive from here. It's only seven kilometers away, just over the Belgian border. Now we'll go and see what he's got. I don't like going to Driss's house and thinking, I've got to have this. He's the one who knows his land, his products, who knows how to tell me here, this is ready. Wait another week. And in the middle of winter, it's not crazy. You see, we've removed a big wild thing here and it's hurting me. But you pulled well, it out, we? you let it rest there a bit. Yes. Driss Delanotte, 47, is a purist like himself. He produces without pesticides, edible flowers, forgotten vegetables, and aromatic plants. If you smell this, that's verbena, it smells like summer. And you can see that little by little by it's little. Starting to have yeah, it's greening up a bit, inches. It's the first strength of spring. And in two weeks, we'll already have the new thumbs, eh? If you can see that, these are things, these are daytime things. That's good. Once again, I'm not the one who decides what I'm going to put on the menu. It's you and it's not you. It's nature. In the fields, things aren't exactly bountiful either. Florent will have to make do with leeks. I feel it's full of life when you eat it. It's, it's, now this on the other hand, you don't take directly in the morning for breakfast, but you have to accept that. Afterwards it wakes you up. Yes, it does, but it's full of life. And this is leek asparagus. It's really the product that Driss introduced me to. And that's the stem we're going to work on. Leeks, cabbage, salsify. It's not very glamorous. It's because we wanted to eat nothing but glamour that that we ended up with all the drifts we have today. Eating tomatoes that have no taste, no flavor, no interest for the body in any season, ditto for strawberries, because that on paper is more glamorous, because it's red, but that's just marketing. At some point, you have to stop the bullshit. In winter, there's no need to eat these products. Besides, it's not even good, there's no point. Florent orders 4,000 leek plants from Driss every year. He pays two and a half times more for these organic vegetables than for wholesalers, but without intermediaries or transport, He's making it worth. The chef from France's north despises wasting anything. And especially not the glasses of his beloved leeks, which usually end up in the garbage can. We're going to make a leek glass oil. And it's an oil that's great for all kinds of seasonings. Here I'm using sunflower oil because it's the most neutral oil we have here at home. And that's it. Then I put it in the blender. Here we blend it for eight minutes, now we filter it. We'll recover the glass of leek. You can use it as a tapenade. Or to bind a sauce or vinaigrette, if you like. And now we're going to make a mayonnaise with the oil from the leek glass. So hop, classic. Customers often think it's a guacamole that I've made, but it's just a mayonnaise with glass leek oil. With french fries, it's extraordinary. With anything, it'll be magic. Just a little more salt, and it's perfect. At Florence, even stale bread gets a second life. Oriane, the sommelier, creates the house cocktails. I'm a bit like the witch of the Vermont Inn. It's the work of an alchemist. I put it in water with sugar. The recipes in the books indicated a little baker's yeast, so I put in our liquid sourdough. That way I'm completely local. Above all, keep it in the fridge. Because it works so well, it can explode the bottles. Orian has a point. Her fermented drinks are sometimes a little too fizzy. What?
It's an orange soda. It's the rye that gives it the citrus. Kvass, kefir, and kombucha. Orient concocts potions for every menu change. It's yuck like that, but at the same time, I think it's great fun. The aim is to do without wine as much as possible. The only non-Flemish product Florent is still willing to serve. Florent's success with radical cuisine now extends to various dishes. He has opened three other restaurants, including one in the heart of downtown Lille, Le Blumpo, which means flower pot in Flemish. Just fine. No surprises. Florent comes in once a week to back up the six cooks and four waiters he employs. No, she's bluffed me yet again. He serves 80 overdrafts a day here, for an average plate costing 80 euros. Service, please. What service would you like to start? Mushrooms, we have two and a six, please. At a time when the restaurant sector is struggling to recruit, has no trouble finding staff. After the shooting, he and his partner, Kevin, welcome 30-year-old Elsa. She fled the stress of Paris three months ago to settle in Lille with her partner. She's applying for a job as chef de partie, in charge of starters. You know the way we work? Yeah, that's what I liked about it. For me, it's important to have a terroir and an identity. I use fresh produce, that's the thing. Yes. It's an economy. Otherwise, I don't want to be in a kitchen where there's only frozen food. Because it's you learn bit, uh, nothing from using the right stuff. Simple. That's not what I want to do. That's fine. So yes, we work four days a week. We have... 11 hour days on average, the legal maximum in the kitchen. But Florent and his partner have other arguments. Six weeks paid vacation a year. That's okay. Minimum because it depends on how it falls. It's two weeks in December because we celebrate the holidays with our family and with... And we don't want to... We'd be loaded. Those would be great numbers. But actually, we want to party too. It's fun, it's fun. Why does everyone do it? And when it comes to salary, it's the employers who ask the candidate how much she wants. There are no salary scales. So you don't have to answer that question now. We understand that it's rare. That's that question. Basically, we have 800 euros of fixed costs each. Oh. That's right. 950. So. Uh, so 1600 euros. So yeah, sounds good to me. 1,600 euros a month, the salary of a dishwasher at Florence. Okay, great. The offer will be 1,800 euros net, which is 150 euros above the average for this position. So do you want to play hide and seek? Yeah, go ahead. Does dad count? Yes. Okay, one, two. Between shifts, Florent tries to devote a little time to his children. Two-year-old Kaya and Cobb eight. Six. Nineteen. For the time being, he keeps an eye on the evening bookings. Twenty-eight. Twenty-nine. Thirty. Hidden or not, on my way. Found it. This dad is as demanding at home as he is at work. Yes, dear? A loaf of bread. That's what we say to daddy. Uh, yes. The snack here is apple juice and a slice of real bread. So my cousin makes the bread. It's quarantine, and the kids love it. I think little Kaya has eaten nothing but this bread since she was born. The great thing about these moments is that I remember all the same moments that I experienced here as a child with my father, in fact. And it was already the same gestures. That's what's so great. My father has hardly changed. Neither have I. You're flattering. Yes, it's the mother. You have to create moments like that because on the schedule, it doesn't exist. There's no room for it. Good night, sheep. No matter how much he denies it, Florent is insatiable.
Did you see how green the hay is? It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, he's beautiful. His latest whim, brew his own beer. He's training in this workshop until he can build his own. There, you infused. No, it salted it. Uh, we can go now, good. yeah. We're good to go. It's crazy how it smells like vanilla. The bean falls here. That's hay from the inn. It's Vermont hay. Hay is something I work with a lot in the kitchen. I make things smoked with hay, infusions too. And now we're making a beer, and it's a hit every time. We use hay, it's great. Beers with hay, but also with beet, mustard seed, and even roasted potato peelings. This is the first batch, right? This is the second. It's very farmhouse. It's still bitter, but there's still all the sugar. There's still all the sugar from the cereals. The idea is to determine whether it's strong enough, strong enough in hay, or if it needs more infusion. These craft beers will ferment for a month. Before ending up on the tables of these restaurants, Notably at Burbucks, the Beer Belly, the latest establishment opened by Florent three years ago. Florent, he serves formulas for around 10 euros this time, with Flamiches au Mont des Cas, a northern cheese. And his signature dish, fries dripping with maroil mousse. It's better than McDonald's, you know? He doesn't like cheese and he's eating it, so... Yeah? Yeah, it's enormous. Florent isn't done making his winning recipes bear fruit. He's due to open two more restaurants this year in Béthune and Dunkirk. I like it when it starts out white. In the north, that's for sure. At the mouth of the Bervrach, a coastal river in North Finisterre that flows into the Iroise Sea, Sylvain Houchet. I'll try not to fall overboard just yet. Biologist and shellfish farmer. So far, so good. And his friend Stenmark begin a highly experimental fishing trip. Sten, you've got to be careful because sometimes it gets unhooked. And you go with it. That's how we lost a few trainees. In this cage, Sylvain raises some very rare shellfish that the top chefs are after. Come on then, let's have a look. Abalone. The abalone here are four years old and they're coming to maturity for us. They're plump and I think they'll be served on fine tables. That's really the snail's attitude. A luxury snail sold for up to a hundred euros a kilo. The caviar of Brittany, traditionally cooked in a pan with parsley. So he's got green eyes. And that's a sign of intelligence. But Stenmark isn't in it for the abalone. This man from Finisterre is a cheese ripener, and he has a rather crazy way of aging his cheeses. He immerses them in the sea with the abalone. In fact, it's a Bleu Breton, a farmhouse raw milk cheese, made in the Côte d'Amour near Cap Fréhel. In fact, I used to protect the cheese with beeswax. Matured at a depth of 10 meters, they become creamier with the pressure of water. This slightly crazy idea actually came about during the inauguration of Sylvain's boat, because it's true that when he inaugurated this beautiful boat, we found ourselves on the quayside next to his workshop, and they had brought out a cage with bottles of wine, in fact, a great burgundy wine. And we saw the bottles come out with the shells stuck to them. And that's when I got a little sparkle in my eye and thought, well, what the heck? Why don't I immerse cheeses like wine? And we started experimenting with Sylvain, and that's it. It's the safe. The cheeses will remain immersed for between four and eight weeks. Shall we go? She's not going to move. Yes, she'll be fine. They haven't announced any major storms in the next four days? No, that's for a week. Basically, it won't move. Stain hopes one day to be able to market this atypical blue cheese. 
See you soon. It's already got a name. Bleu d'Iroise. At the end of Brittany, the end of the land, Finisterre. A name that evokes craggy coasts, wide open spaces and wild moors. But also, and this is less well known, a land of gourmets where men and women perpetuate an ancestral cuisine. So there you have it. We eat with our eyes first. Some reinvent it. We go for langoustine, my kind of thing. And still others work tirelessly to create new flavors. A land of a thousand riches, where those with a passion for taste and good food have to deal with another local peculiarity. At the tip of the rat, in this weather, it's not very interesting because you can't see anything, except to come and eat good crepes. Artichoke, edible goat's cheese, preserved lemon, and a little pesto. Bon appétit. Thank you, Stenmark. Stenmark, the man who immerses these Iowa's blues, has one obsession. To make Brittany a land of cheeses. As a child, he was already scouring the region's markets with his parents. Yes, it's summer. At the age of 23, he set up his own business. Today, he has 10 employees and three trucks that crisscross the markets of Finisterre. I'm going to work on the blueprints, me and the girls. Is that okay? Yes, it's good. 10 years ago, Breton cheeses could be counted on the fingers of one hand. We put the BZH logo on because it's important to put it on labels so that people can distinguish our Breton products from the others. Stain can now offer around 30 of the 80 products in its shop window. Let's go with our friends from Corsica, Brittany next to Corsica. How's that? Brittany isn't a cheese country, because here milk has always been reserved for making butter. We've got little blue cheese from the Côte d'Armor. So the first challenge is to make people understand that there are good Breton cheeses. But this customer will stick with Bleu d'Auvergne. Stein doesn't give up. I'll serve you, sir. Then we also have a product, a great equivalent, but made in Brittany. Would you like to hear about it? La Pilette. Isn't that after Aïeul, as in Aïeul? Yes. Would you be interested in tasting it? Yes. Would you like a piece of the Aïeul? Shall we have both? Here we go. A long education that's starting to pay off. We're at 35 euros and 12 cents, please. We've got quite a bit of cheese. It's Brittany where we meet. We have quite a lot. Worth the effort. And it's good to discover all that, in fact. Stenmark has helped create these Breton nuggets. His maturing cellars near Brest are a kind of nursery for him. It's here that he seeks to sublimate the work of a dozen local producers. On this day, he comes to pamper his famous pilette, Cantal Breton, produced in the Côte d'Armor. Here, I'm actually removing the mushroom that grows on the surface, which gives us a little white covering to prevent it from growing too much. So here we are on, I'd say, almost prototypes because it hasn't been around for long. It's the only pressed paste with crushed curds to be found in Brittany. He's still getting to know his babies. Every week he caresses them. He listens to them. He smells them to study their aging process. In fact, with each cheese, we play a little. The idea is to see how far you can push the maturing process and when you have to stop so as not to go too far and go over to the dark side of the force and develop bad tastes. It could be bitterness. It could be, could be, uh, there are all kinds of strange tastes that can occur in cheese. It's a living product. Here, for example, I have quite young cheeses and overall, I have the same cheese, but six months older. Stein's dream is to one day see his cheeses enthroned on platters all over France. So, in addition to markets, 
To promote his cheeses, he has opened a 150 square meter tasting room right next to his cellars. An investment of almost a million euros for this establishment, which he opened two years ago. So, listen, you're working on maki. Yeah, the one we talked about a little while ago, the fresh goat's cheese and seaweed maki. In the kitchen, Johan Kunadek was poached from a Michelin restaurant to surprise people with his cheeses and fine food. A little lettuce pesto to liven up our dish. And we can serve. It's pretty, it's beautiful. First of all, I have a taste for nature. It's really good. It's really excellent. In fact, it's true that the trials we'd already done worked well, but here, real Breton Maquis. What's that? Real Breton scrub, real Breton scrub. Real smack, real smacking. Braised Maquis of Breton cheese is served the same day in the dining room. It's the first time I've tasted it, and it's true that it's very interesting in terms of texture and taste. It stays in the mouth, it's nice. It's just what you need, it's... On this tasting board, at 18 euros, there are also nems with Breton Toma. Daring combinations right up to the sweet and savory dessert. The chocolate heart in which you'll find organic Castel Neva. A Neuchâtel-type cheese has been placed in the center of the fondant. Steen wants to make an impression so that his customers remember that there are Breton cheeses. But he also knows that these products have to be out of the ordinary if they are to make a name for themselves. And to do that, he needs an exceptional seller like that of Roquefort or Comte. After 20 years of searching, he thinks he's finally found it. Is it far-fetched? He's a bit of a rogue. I pass it everywhere, the Painfeld Forts. Fort Pinfeld, a Vauban-type fort built in the 18th century. It protected Brest from attackers. Sten is currently in discussions with the Guilherme Town Council, which owns the fort, to obtain a mining permit. Here we have vaulted tunnels. You could say almost it's ideal for air circulation. The flavor of cheese is always shaped by the place where it's matured. This is our pretty room, in fact. We've got plenty of height, plenty of width. Anyway, uh, I'm pretty confident about the result because we know very well that it works, because in other regions, they do it. And so, you see, one of my dreams is to be able to have shelves on either side of this tunnel and to be able to have lots of cheese. Anyway, I really hope it comes true because, well, it's hot, though. It's a project close to your heart. Oh, uh, well, yes. You know, when you're born into it, that behind it, you can make dreams come true, big projects like that too. Yeah, that, uh, sorry about that. Fort Pinfeld may one day give birth to Brittany's first controlled origin cheese. The quest for recognition is a driving force for many Breton gourmets even when the reputation of their products seems already established. At a time when Douanene is still sleepy, Thierry Lucas' day is off to a flying start. During the summer season, this 55-year-old baker has to deliver to around 30 establishments in the town every day. He has been entrusted with all the hotel codes. He's part of the town's walls. 
you know, everyone here, yes, but that's, I've lived in Douarnenez for 55 years. Yes, yes, yes. I know quite a few people, yes. Here we come to the Vieux Port. This is the Vieux Port d'Anay, where all the little barges on the Saint-Denis used to dock. Here we have the famous Calare, where all the children of Douarnenez learned to swim. I learned to swim when I was seven or eight, and the tradition goes on. It's funny, it's... Thierry is the guarantor of another of the town's traditions, which he defends against all odds. A culinary specialty born here, it moves the crowds in his bakery. No, we're going to bake 12 again. 12 small, 8 medium, 4 large. We must have received 120 kilos of butter this morning. Wigner Man is Brittany's calorie bomb. Bread dough. A lot of butter. A lot of sugar. So it's not all that fatty. And the bread dough is almost 80% water. So it's a not, it's almost a diet cake, you might say, almost. Thierry Lucas has been making them all day long, over 700 a week since he took over his parents' bakery 30 years ago. And it's always the same recipe. This was my father's role when he made his cakes. I kept it. And it's mine here, nobody touches it. Everyone has their own role to make the cake. A cook with his knives, we're the same. Like all baker's children, when you're little, you always watch what your parents are doing. I learned to bake. I learned to bake when I was about eight or 10. Maybe what I liked was the smell of the crust as it came out of the oven. I have lasting memories of that. It'll take about half an hour. The Cuignaman must be both soft and caramelized. Then Thierry Lucas adds one last personal touch, a little sugar syrup. A little, not a lot. There's a has the difference between with and without. It's still nicer with a little syrup. You eat with your eyes first. These Cuignaman have barely had time to cool before they've already been snapped up. Now we'll be able to make a bundle. I've packed the six of the six of eight already to. It's one of the few cakes you can send by post. Sylvie, Thierry's wife, is in charge of dispatching the orders every morning. These are the Queen Amman envelopes. These are the shipping cartons. The advantage of the Queen Amman is that it travels very well. It's not a fragile cake at all. It's not a cake that spoils either because the ingredients are simple and don't spoil easily. So it travels very well. So here we have a map that we've started to scratch out, a map that shows all the countries where we've shipped Queen Amman. Canada, the United States, Chile, Peru, Australia. The cakes have even flown as far as Ushuaia on the southern tip of Argentina. I think it's funny, I think it's funny that it travels so far that people get so nostalgic over a cake. I think it's funny, and what about the Queen Amman, a bit like the Bretons? They're everywhere, that's it exactly. You can find them all over the world. As for Sylvie, she rarely eats Queen Amman, preferring the salty stuff. When she married Thierry 33 years ago, pastry right. making wasn't really her vocation. I was a student and I wanted to be an economics teacher. In other words, back then I wanted to have the baker. I still do, I wanted the baker and there was the bakery to go with it, so there you go. Hello, hello, one sugar of Queen Yaman. Yes, for how many people? Uh, I've got six for six, so they're a bit baked, aren't they? Yes, that's fine, good, very good. Each year the bakery sells around 50,000 Queen Yaman priced from 12 to 18 euros, depending on size. Goes to breast, right? That's 40% of its sales. Thank you, goodbye. He makes prosperity. And notoriety of the Lucas Bakery. I've already tasted last September in Saint-Paul-de-Léon. 
You can make artichokes, you can make cauliflower, but you can't make Queen Amman. For the Lucas family, authentic Queen Amman. Can only come from Duarnane, the others are pale copies. Thierry has even been a member of an association for the defense of Queen Amman for 20 years. These are all the newspaper articles I've kept since the start of our association. Here you can see us when we were at the Senate at the Elysee Palace. We were at the Elysee for a garden party. With other bakers from the town, he lobbied politicians to obtain a label. An indication of controlled origin, like Savoy Tomé or Vendée Brioche, Douanenay Queen Yaman. The aim of our association was to assert loud and clear that Queen Yaman is from Douarnenez and that it's a cake made from bread, dough, butter and sugar. And that's all there is to it. It's not a cake, it's not a Queen Yaman with apples, chocolate, tomato, jam and I don't know what else. It makes me a little angry. Thierry and the other Douarnenez bakers didn't get their label. But they won a small battle thanks to historians' research. Here we are in front of the old bakery where the Queen Amman was born. At the time it was Mr. and Mrs. Crozon's bakery. Today it's a souvenir store. And three or four years ago we put a plaque on the wall of this house to immortalize the event. In the photo you can see Mr. Crozon, the baker, with the bundles of wood still beside him. It's important to protect him so as not to short-circuit the cake. With any industrialist who might want to take it over. Despite two decades of fruitless battles, Thierry hasn't given up hope of obtaining a label for his Duanane Queen Yaman. An hour's drive away, a couple of farmers want to restore the image of a much maligned product, the pig. A symbol of intensive farming in Brittany. On the menu, Guillaume's animals, Plaugastel strawberries salvaged from a local grower's unsold stock. Do they like strawberries? They're not fussy. They're a pleasure to look at, because at least they have appetite. But that's not all. And that's for the vitamins, which are nice. But the big thing is, so the basic diet is cereals and milk. But intrinsically here, they can find mushrooms, tubers, by digging. Guillaume and Severine Roland want to restore Breton pork to its former glory. The little beasts, some weighing up to 100 kilos, roam freely in the undergrowth. They only come out for lunch. The rest of the time, 20 hectares of playground are open to them. Swimming pool? Is the spa? Their life is short, six months, but a happy one. We offer them a nice life. They have enough to eat, to blossom, and then yes, it's to eat them, but they don't know. All the way. They're not, they're not told. They don't have the order. At the same time, we're going to die too, but they're so cute. What's interesting is having a good life. These two breeders fell in love with each other while studying for their BTS in agriculture. They worked for 10 years on intensive livestock farms. Oh, they're in the background. When disgusted, they gave up and started a farm with just four pigs. Here are Penelope, Sachella, and her sister, the brown one, Puce. Hortense and Noemi. Today, they have 130 pigs and sell their meat all over Brittany. What's interesting now is not the pig from the pig from the Curvelevel farm. It's no longer Guillaume and Severine's pig, it's Plugestel's pig. 
So all the same, it's a nice recognition. Every day, Guillaume delivers to his customers all over Finisterre. He values this direct relationship between producer and consumer. When you see the old timers saying to me, this looks like my mom's blood sausage, it's really gratifying. It's so gratifying that it got to the ears of a supermarket in my region that wanted to work with me. She was pretty fed up that he had a piece of pig. They killed everything. Delicatessen, agriculture, they're attacking everything. Banks, travel, pharmacy. They're bastards. I'm allowed to say that. There's no supermarket in this parking lot, but a restaurant with two Michelin stars. Hello? His customer is Olivier Bellin, a famous chef from Brittany. I'd kiss you, but I shouldn't. Boudin de Séverine. Filet mignon. The chef tasted Guillaume's product six years ago. A revelation. There are onions. Rose de Roscoff, please. Rose de Roscoff onions, and you can eat them raw like that. It's magical, a little coarser. A tribute to the Plugestel pig at one of Brittany's finest restaurants. I wasn't expecting it. It was through chance discussions bouncing around that I met Olivier Bellin. Olivier tastes it. It's the best. Me, I stayed. A bit crow. At the time, I told him it was a work of art. He told me I was talking funny, but yes, it's a work of art. When you see these animals lying down, the hair on the little ones, it's fabulous. So you see beyond that, there's a respect. So he's a precursor. He's a precursor. But if tomorrow we don't move in that direction, we're dead. Olivier Bellin has become an ambassador for good Breton food. A talent scout. In Plomodienne, a small town of 2,000 inhabitants at the entrance to the Crozon Peninsula, this Breton chef has succeeded in transforming his Auberge des Glaziques from a simple worker's inn into a relay and castle. There will be two Collins more cooked on the walk, and we chain together a language. Today, 49-year-old Olivier Belen is aiming for the Holy Grail, the third star. And that's it. With his brigade of 10 cooks, he lays claim to a typically Breton gastronomy. Compositions of tripe products married with seafood. Is it lamb with periwinkles? Lamb winkles? No choice of teeth. It will enhance the dish a little. Raw tartare with filet mignon and just the mons d'arrêt lamb with artichoke puree and the artichoke rolled in salted fat. In other words, we're really in Brittany and there we have a juice with big or no in choice. And we have oyster leaves. Careful now. Let's go. Take two bells, mademoiselle, please. Combining turbo fillet with oyster. So far, so good inside. And on dually chips. Or this recipe for langoustine with black pudding cream. A squeeze of lemon for freshness. Or this lobster topped with the pig's head veil. And there you have it. A cuisine inspired by Olivier Bellin's childhood on this tip of Finisterre. And my chef, it's super perfect. One thing that really got me going at one point was scallop tagliatelle with sausage. And it's true that it's something that has marked me because I loved it. It's true that I decided to work on it. So it's the meeting of the sea and the land that flows into the sea. That's where langoustine on black pudding, creamy black pudding and lobster with pig's head veil come from. I'm a piece of land that flows into the sea. That's how we end up on my plate. Between 65 and 230 euros a menu to discover these curious combinations. So here, blue fish a la flamme, in other words, sardines accompanied by a sardine vinaigrette. Tomato vinaigrette. In summer, his restaurant is packed. Would you like me to do the table bill, madame? I've already done it. Do you have a tray? Yes. Backstage. 
Olivier Bellin's mother, Marie Noël, 76, keeps the accounts. She still hasn't got on the computer. Hop on. It's a machine that wasn't of my generation. That I'm obliged to, how shall I put it? Tame, tame, that's exactly the right word. Mother and son have worked together for 22 years. We have customers who come regularly. Sometimes I don't show up at the container and I hear them. Is the mother still there? Is mom still here? I'm going to greet them because they're longtime customers and customers like to be recognized. Here you go, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you, madame. Enjoy your evening. Marie Noel and her son are like an old couple in the city as in the country. Thank you for your visit. Thank you for your visit. They still live together in the same house, 500 meters from the inn. Here, I found you a little something. In the meantime, thank you. Remind you of something. Yes, it does. The father is absent that day. A long time ago. L'Eglasi has been a family home for four generations. At the turn of the century, Marie Noel's mother was already serving soup to visitors. There were rings and horses were tied along the whole length. In the 1960s, Marie Noel decided to turn it into a working class restaurant. We used to come in here, there was the bar. Then there were the tables for the workers. There was a worker's menu every day except in summer. A soup. Then there was a second hot starter, scallops beef tongue. Then there was a roast or steak, meat with French fries or steamed potatoes. And then dessert, there was no cheese, coffee. And all this for uh, five francs fifty, one euro per meal, all inclusive. Gourmet child. Olivier grew up surrounded by ovens and decided to become a chef himself. He honed his skills with top chefs such as Joel Robuchon. Then at the age of 27, he returned home. He convinced his parents to transform the inn into a gourmet restaurant. He wanted it, he wanted it, he wanted it. The sums involved were astronomical, so I put the brakes on. Besides, I know I wasn't doing him any favors if I didn't give him what he wanted. All right, then. We argue, and then we're like... like you're the one who... Says, oh, it's me, it's always me. He's the one who's very strong with his words. But since I'm his mother, I can overlook a lot of things. You've got... Despite the renovations, Olivier struggles to attract customers. Until a visit from a Parisian critic crowned him the little king of the end of the world. It's the beginning of success. Olivier won his first star in 2005, his second in 2010, and is now aiming for his third. All know that the road ahead is a long one. Today, to get people from all over the world to come and visit you, you really have to write a cuisine of purity and with a very strong identity. So yes, that's what I'm working for. But then, I'm only nine years old. That's the beginning of life. That's what I always say. At 49, you still have 40 years of work ahead of you. Maybe we'll make it. I hope so for your sake. To develop his cuisine, Olivier Belin continues to seek inspiration in his native Finisterre. We're on our way to a special place called Taimark. It's a sort of little cove where I used to come with my friends because normally some weeds must have appeared, seagrasses. We'll go and see if they've arrived. The great chef would like to introduce more and more seaweed into his recipes. So you see, this is spaghetti. And this can be eaten the same. We could make a tomé with this. Blanch for 10 seconds. And with a little cerevin butter, it makes spaghetti of the sea. And you can eat it raw, too. And the smaller, small, the more you can eat it raw. This is sea lettuce. You see, it's transducid. You can wrap fish. You can wrap vegetables. You can make a tata, too. So there you have it. We've got the techniques. It's up to you to adapt. On the cove of his childhood, there's also this plant that grows on the rocky shores of the Atlantic. Sea chrysanthemums, also known as sea saddles. You have to find the young shoots. You see, this is really good. It's got a little orange flavor. 
it's a little iodized because in fact when the tide comes in there's this iodized side of course and above all it's a little taste of orange carrot or even lemon after that it's up to you when we punctuate our dishes instead of using mountain herbs and things like that we'll use this and then we're completely in our own universe and that's what you have to find it took me a long time it took me a long time because I think you get better over the years and I think my cooking like a what I've been trying to tell people for 20 years at the auberge is starting to mature. And I've had several eras, several stages. And I'm in the process of understanding why I'm doing this. And why I'm writing it here. If Olivier Bellin wants to reach the heights of Breton gastronomy, another, even further west, has just risked everything to give one of Brittany's oldest symbols a fast. On the Pointe du Rat, the last piece of continental Europe before America, a man set out to fill a restaurant with haute couture crepes at takeaway prices. 34-year-old Stéphane Pichon opened his creperie just 10 days ago. It's a childhood dream to open my own restaurant, so uh, here it is at last. I've managed to bring my project to completion and of course yes it's a lot of pressure for his first business Stefan took over Larmen a 130 seat restaurant he put all his savings into it and took out a loan of 430,000 euros the banks had good reason to trust him so uh, that's the prize I won in January so I'm very proud the 2020 prize for the best crepe in France, and therefore in the world. He beat the best in the business with this galette made with seasonal vegetables and flowers. All on a pastry whose recipe he wants to keep secret. Crepe, we've got the wheat to make. In fact, and he asked us to blur out the dosages on this piece of paper. Open wider, because the more you work it, the more elastic the dough will become. For this adventure, he hired three crepe makers, a cook, and asked Marie Line, his wife, a childminder, to stop working and help him in the kitchen. I don't mind, I don't mind, no. Yeah, you have to do everything. I've done a bit of room work, too. Yeah, yeah, you have to do everything. You have to touch everything. In this line of work, especially as a boss. Then you can make me a bacon, chorizo, goat's cheese, tome, eggs, mirror. For and the past since... three days, Marilyn has been trying her hand at cooking crepes on her traditional Billy's hot plates. I've got the sardine comfort. Yes. After that, when you've got a helping hand, it's fine. Stefan is never far away to reassure her. He's the first to warm up. Then the helping hand is taken. The challenge of these crepiers is to offer original galettes made exclusively with fresh produce. It's spinach, onion compote, and a little butter. Always butter. Always butter. For the price of an ordinary crepe. We have buckwheat. Here we have apple granita, sardine confit, and then a little salad to garnish, and that's it. This is the galette pain sardine sold for six euro seventy. What's this? It Bestery crab meat pesto and lemon zest. All these recipes are Stéphane's inventions. The most expensive is less than nine euros. And it's always a hit. We've just come from Bordeaux and we're not used to eating this kind of food. Like many, his customers didn't come by chance. You don't have to eat sardines. We saw that it was one of the best. That drew us in a little. Noon, the room is almost full. 
about 60 covers in all, just enough to pay the restaurant's bills. On the other hand, the terrace is deserted, 50 covers allowed. Well then, it's not good. Even if in Brittany, bad weather means the certainty of sunshine afterwards. This doesn't really do Stefan any good, as he relies heavily on tourists. La Pointe du Rat, in this weather, it's not very interesting because you can't see anything. No, but from Monday, the weather's fine. All right, here we go. Small consolation. The weather is finally allowing him to take a break. To give his restaurant every chance, Stefan is open seven days a week. And until now, he'd only gone home to sleep. Coco. He finds his children. Leia, 11 years old. Cedric, 9. And the youngest, Olivia, 6 months old. They used to carry their daddy around in the middle of the day like this. This is the first time since the opening that I've taken a short break in the afternoon. It feels good. It's good because I haven't seen them since. When I leave, they're asleep. When I come back, they're asleep. Since the opening of their restaurant 10 days ago, I take the hit. The couple's daily routine has been turned upside down. In their previous life, Stefan earned 2,500 euros a month as a chef. Marilyn, a nursery assistant, earned 1,400 euros. Today, however, no salary. Their house is on loan from Stefan's brother. An adventure without a safety net and with a little anxiety. Sometimes, wouldn't it be better to be a cookery teacher or work in a central kitchen? And then make a little money on the side, and then you've got 17 hours at home. After that, unfortunately, it's something I can't control. It's that I'm ambitious, so I like work, and I'm passionate about it. And I'm passionate. He's not happy in his job. Automatically, family life will suffer, too. So no, 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 no. No, I'm happy for us, for him. To stand out from the 1,600 other creperies in Brittany, Stefan invents a new recipe every day. This afternoon, he meets a childhood friend, a fisherman at the port of Odiernes. Is it busy? Uh, how are you? I'm fine. Do you have any lobster? We'll take three pieces. Is this water? Yes. Okay, listen, come on, give me... To keep his crepe du jour Early. affordable, Stefan is going to need a special price. Can I come with you? Sure, sure, five kilometers, perfect. Is the lobster good? Yeah, lobster. How much is the, how much is it? Maybe 15, 15 euros a kilo. Sounds great, very nice. Thanks a lot. Half the price of a wholesaler. That's the advantage of having fishing buddies. Oh yeah, right. Straight to the restaurant. put lobster on his menu, Stefan will have to calculate the portions in each pancake. To the gram. Yeah, nice. Yeah, nice. 30 to 35 there. I think we'll be pretty good, yeah. We'll be all right. I'm going to go to the limit of my margin because if you make a lobster crepe, you have to put lobster in it. Otherwise, people will make remarks. With a lobster, Stefan will be able to make around 15 crepes, each selling for 8 euros 5 years. There's no secret to it. Secret to success is knowing how to count too. It's not just about being a good cook. You have to know how to count, it's essential. Otherwise, we're headed for disaster. The lobsters are snacked. Afterwards, you mustn't overcook them, otherwise they'll become ferocious then placed on a galette and served with a beet coulis and a lemon and oyster chantilly. The recipe must then pass the tasting test with Marilyn. Figure. Very good, yeah. 
She's a picky eater, so she's my first tester. When she likes it, she says so. When she doesn't like it... That evening, the restaurant owner sold six lobster crepes. It's beautiful already. Paid his All employees, right. his expenses, his loan. He needs to make 30,000 euros in sales every sales. month. After 10 days open, Stefan's horizon is clearing. In his first month of business, he has already achieved his first targets.